you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to a Bible answer. My name is Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thank you for watching a Bible answer today. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer Bible questions that have been sent in by our viewers. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Jimmy Colvett. I preach for the Church of Christ in Matthews, Missouri. Hello, my name is Travis Quatermas. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ in Dexter, Missouri. Good morning. My name is R. W. McAllister, and I'm the preacher at the Anna Church of Christ in Anna, Illinois. These brethren have been doing a great job in answering your questions, and we appreciate them taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Now, our first question today is an interesting one, and it goes to Brother Quatermas. The questioner says, How can I keep from holding a grudge against someone who has stolen my girlfriend? We'll give that to you, Brother Quatermas. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, certainly our, our heart goes out to you in dealing with a very difficult uh, situation emotionally. We pray that you will find some peace with the difficulties you're experiencing and perhaps the answers, the advice we'll give you from the scriptures will help you to find that. Let me first of all suggest that you take a realistic appraisal of the situation. Uh, you say, for example, that someone has stolen your girlfriend, but is that really what happened? Surely you're not suggesting that someone kidnapped your girlfriend and brainwashed her into uh, no longer being your girlfriend and becoming the girlfriend of another man. Perhaps the thing that one really needs to look into one's heart and, and say, is it, po is it possible that perhaps she was not in love with you and that she fell in love with this other man and therefore decided to end the relationship with you and begin a new relationship with him? Perhaps the thing that has really been hurt here, besides your feelings, of course, is your pride. Let me suggest that you should have a serious heart-to-heart -heart discussion with your former girlfriend and just ask her very honestly, very openly, is that the case? Uh, and if so, then uh, you have to swallow your pride and you have to wish her well in her new relationship. Uh, after all, if you really love her, uh, you will want what is best for her. And if that means she's no longer your girlfriend, uh, then you have to accept that and you have to wish her well in this new relationship. And who knows? Uh, that may be the very thing that in the future may win her affection back. And furthermore, even though your feelings are hurt, you might also want to consider that she might in fact have done you a favor. After all, you don't really want to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't truly love you, do you? Why would you cheat yourself that way? Now as far as holding a grudge is concerned, uh, the first thing you must do is resolve to follow the teaching and example of Jesus Christ, no matter how you may feel emotionally about a person. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, our Lord said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now notice, the Lord is not commanding us to like our enemies emotionally, but he is telling us to love them in the sense that we can do good to them and we can pray for them. Now have you done this where your former girlfriend and her new boyfriend are concerned? If you will sincerely pray for them and do good to them, then that will go a long way toward preventing you from holding any grudges against them or healing any grudges that you may be holding against them now. Furthermore, Jesus practiced what he preached. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, the Bible says of Christ, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, 
who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Let us follow this example, and we will find ourselves at peace with ourselves and with God, even when we have been wronged by others. Thank you for the question. We pray the answer has been helpful. Thank you very much. Our next question to Brother McAllister, was Melchizedek a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ? Brother McAllister. Well, in short, the answer is no. Melchizedek was not the same person as Jesus, contrary to a rather popular belief, which stems from a, a misunderstanding of certain verses in Hebrews chapter 7. Melchizedek is first mentioned in Genesis 14. Abram, Abraham, returning from the rescue of his nephew Lot, crossed paths with Melchizedek, who was king of Salem. And Salem, incidentally, is believed to uh, be early Jerusalem, Psalm 76 and verse 2. In addition to being a king, he was described as priest of the Most High God, Genesis 14, verse 18. Now, his prominence is revealed in the fact that he blessed Abraham, because the greater always blesses the lesser. And Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. That is, he gave uh, to this king priest a tenth of his spoils. So we see in the old law, the lesser tithes to the greater. The Hebrew writer uses this encounter between Abraham and Melchizedek, along with a prophecy from Psalm 110, to demonstrate the superiority of the priesthood of Christ to that of the Levitical system, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 4 through 10. And beyond that, there were some similarities between Melchizedek and Christ, so that we could rightly say that Melchizedek was a type, that means a picture or a symbolic preview of Jesus. That doesn't mean, however, that they were the same person. In fact, the Bible teaches otherwise. Notice a few points. Number one, Christ was said to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 6 chapter 6 and verse 10, and also, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 5, 6 and 10, chapter 6, verse 20, and Hebrews 7, 11. Now, the Greek word taxis, meaning order, indicates a similar arrangement. For example, just as Melchizedek was both a priest and a king at the same time, so is Christ, Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Secondly, we notice that Melchizedek was without father and without mother, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, the per first part of verse 3. Now, here's what that means. His divine role was not handed down from his parents. Neither heredity nor genealogy played any part. So, neither was Jesus' priesthood determined by genealogy, as was the Aaronic priests, Exodus 28 and verse 1, Numbers 3.10. Melchizedek's administration, thirdly, was without beginning of days and end of life, Hebrews 7, also verse 3, the middle part of the verse. And again, the meaning is that his priesthood was not for a fixed term, as in the case of Levitical priests. Under the Old uh, Testament, priests began their service at the age of 30, and the Levites served from the age of 30 uh, to 50, Numbers chapter 4, verses 3 and following. Now, apparently, however, there was no term limit, if you will, with reference to Melchizedek. Again, in this regard, he foreshadowed Christ, who serves continually as our priest throughout the Christian dispensation. And finally, that Melchizedek was not the same person as Jesus can be seen in that he is said to be like unto the Son of God, Hebrews 7, verse 3. And you may also wish to look at Matthew chapter 22, verses 42 through 44, uh, to see how Jesus applies the prophecy in Psalm 110, and the mention of Melchizedek uh, to himself. And we thank you for this question. Thank you, Brother McAllister, for that good answer. Our next question goes to Brother Colvett. Brother Colvett, the query says, did Mary know Jesus was the Messiah? If so, why didn't his brothers believe in him? Brother Colvett. Well, this is a good question. It's an interesting question. It's thought-provoking, and it deserves some study and and consideration. Let's think about Messiah to start with. The Hebrew word Messiah means the anointed one or anointed. The word Christ, the Greek word, 
means anointed. So Jesus Christ was the anointed one to come that God sent into the world to take away the sins of the world through man's obedience to God. Now let's look at the question as it pertains to Mary. Did Mary know that Jesus was the Messiah? In Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and told him that Elizabeth was going to have a child. And approximately six months later, the same angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and informed her that she was going to have a child. And notice some things that the angel said to her. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And he told her she was going to bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, just like what the Lord had told Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, that she would bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And he goes on to say, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Now it appears, it seems to me, that Mary is questioning all of this in her mind. Because she asked, verse 34, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Then the angel explained to her that this was, would be, he would be called the Son of God. The power of the highest would come upon her. Then Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth said, Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? It seems Mary is still just wondering. And she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Maybe she's coming a little closer to her understanding. Then in Luke chapter 2, we read of the birth of Jesus and how the angels appeared to, to the shepherds in the field at night and told them of the birth of the Savior in, in Bethlehem. And so they go and they see him and then they spread the word about uh, the birth of the, of the Savior. And the Bible tells us that Mary pondered the words of the shepherds in her heart. Then you remember in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was 12, they went to, the, uh, to observe the Passover. And after having observed that and was returning home, Jesus was not with them. And they found him later in the temple. And they were disturbed over his being behind, not going with them. But he said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? But in Luke 2 and verse 50, there's an indication that they did not understand the saying which he spake unto them. But then, as we get to John chapter 2, there is the first miracle that Jesus performed in turning water to wine at the wedding feast. They were without wine, and his mother said to him, she was there also, his mother said to him, they have no wine. And then he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. But then she said to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. It seems now that she's realizing that Jesus certainly had some supernatural powers. It seems to me that at first, as Mary began to be told these matters, that she was questioning. She really wondered. But that in time to come, after observing her son, that she came to realize that he was the Messiah. As far as his brothers are concerned, in John chapter 7 and verse 5, we are told that they did not believe in him. We are not told why they did not believe in him. The late Brother Guy in Woods has suggested in his commentary on the gospel according to John, pages 142 and 143, that 
perhaps they had never witnessed his miracles, or if they had, that, uh, that they did not think that this proved his, his deity. But in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, we note that his brothers had obviously come to, to believe in him after his resurrection, and maybe even because of the resurrection. But the apostles were gathered together in an upper room in Acts 1 and verse 13. And the Bible says in verse 14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Obviously, being gathered to that, gather, continuing in prayer and supplication, the brothers had come to believe in him. Why they did not at first, we're not told, but they evidently changed their mind after his resurrection. So I believe Mary came to believe it, although she didn't understand at first. I hope this is a helpful answer, and uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Brother Colvin. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled Psalm 23. Certainly this is one of the uh, favorite Bible passages of many, and I thought that many would enjoy this tract, exploring and explaining the 23rd Psalm. If you would like this tract, entitled Psalm 23, or a Bible Correspondence Course, just contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may call our toll-free number, 1-800-436-0463, or you may email us at a Bible answer at oabs.org, and this information will be seen again at the conclusion of our program today. Now back to our questions. Our next question to Brother Quatermus. The query says, by describing death as falling asleep, did Jesus teach that conscious existence ends at the moment of death in John 11, 11 through 14? Brother Quaternus. Well, thank you for this excellent question. The short answer is no. Let me ask you a question. Does your conscious existence end when you fall asleep? Well, of course not. Your brain continues to function, you dream, your subconscious is active, etc. So just because the Bible describes death as a sleep, that does not at all imply that we cease to exist or conscious existence ends at that time. It is true that Jesus spoke of his dead friend Lazarus as being asleep in John chapter 11, verses 11 to 14. But exactly what did our Lord mean by that? It will help us to understand the answer to that question if we remember that according to the book of God, man is a dual being consisting of both body and soul or spirit. In James chapter 2 and verse 26, we read, For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead also. And you can note a similar teaching in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. So physical death then occurs when the spirit or the soul leaves the body. So which part of us is described as sleeping in death? In Daniel 12 and verse 2 we read, And many of them that, now listen, that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. What part of man sleeps in the dust of the earth? Why, the body, of course. Therefore, the body is said to sleep in death. And so because of this, the Bible describes it as such. In death, it is simply the body, an empty shell. And it, of course, has no conscious existence whatsoever at that point. However, the Bible never refers to the soul or the spirit as sleeping in death. The doctrine of soul sleeping is thus seen to be wholly unscriptural. In fact, Jesus was quite clear that the soul is conscious after death. If one reads the Lord's account of the deaths of the rich man and Lazarus, in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, he clearly taught that their souls survived the deaths of their bodies and were conscious in the Hadean world. In fact, the spirits of Abraham and the rich man even have a conversation with each other. So while it is true that Scripture speaks of the body as sleeping in death, 
It never teaches the false doctrine of soul sleeping. Quite the contrary, as the Bible teaches the conscious existence of the soul after the death of the body. At the general resurrection at the end of time, our resurrected bodies will be reunited with our departed spirits, and we will face then the final judgment of God. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Our next question is um, serious nature to Brother McAllister, and it describes the situation in the home. The lady says, my husband is very jealous of me to the point of being overbearing and paranoid. What can I do? We'll give that to you, Brother McAllister. Well, this is a very serious question, and uh, very difficult to answer uh, with a high degree of accuracy because we don't have all of the facts. But I'd recommend for starters an honest self-examination for both you and your husband. Ask yourself honestly, is there anything I'm doing in my life that may feed his suspicions? And your husband must honestly ask himself, does my wife give me just cause for being overbearing and feeling paranoid? Call your attention to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, the reason for the wife's submission is that her husband is her head. He has the same relation to her that Christ has to the church. Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. And the word Savior here can have the meaning uh, preserver. So the husband is the head of the wife and her preserver as well. As head, he loves, leads, and guides. As preserver, he protects, provides, and cares for her. Nothing could acclaim the role of the wife any more than comparing it to the role of the church as the bride of Christ. Now she is to be subject in everything. That is, everything that is in accordance with the will of God. Now God wouldn't expect or approve of any wife obeying her husband if he required her to do something contrary to the will of the Lord. Anything contrary uh, that, were, that would compromise, rather, her loyalty to the Lord Jesus. But also notice the Bible's instructions to husbands in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands are not to be iron-fisted dictators who, who scream and yell and demand to know their wives' whereabouts every minute of every day. They're to love their wives, as Christ also loved the church. Now, how much does Christ love the church? Enough that he gave his life for it. Husbands are not to treat their wives as, as inferior subjects. Let me say it again. Husbands are not to treat their wives as inferior subjects. If a man loves his wife the way he should, he will mature beyond the desire for self-indulgence and self-satisfaction because overbearing concern and paranoia have no place in a healthy, Christ-centered marriage. But look at the Apostle Paul's instructions also regarding love in 1 Corinthians 13. He says of love in verses 4 and 5, Love suffereth long, and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Now let's look very quickly at the components of these verses. Love suffereth long as in, and is kind. Love is patient in the face of provocation, and kindness is showing good to others. Love doesn't envy. Instead, it's very pleased that others are happy. Love doth not behave herself unseemly. If a person is acting in love, he or she will be courteous. It seeketh not her own. Love is more concerned with the happiness and the well-being of others than with self. Love is not easily provoked but is willing to endure inconsiderate behavior and insults. Love thinketh no evil. It does not suspect the actions of others, but always first gives the benefit of any doubt. The issue of trust seems to be at the very heart of this matter. And I believe that if both parties will sincerely apply the teachings found in Scripture, uh, those that we've examined, also what we find in Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 and 11, that 
your situation might improve. I pray that it will. And I humbly suggest also that you both seek the services of a very sound, faithful Christian counselor because there's quite a bit going on here that would benefit from that kind of guidance. But I appreciate this very important, very serious question. Thank you so much to each of these brethren for the good job they've done in answering your questions today. I was reading about concrete the other day. You know, concrete has been around for a long time. The Assyrians and the Babylonians used clay as their cement, and then the Egyptians used lime and gypsum cement. The first modern concrete, which was called hydraulic cement, was invented by a British engineer by the name of John Smeaton. In 1824, Joseph Asden, a British inventor, invented Portland cement, which continues to be the most dominant cement used in concrete production today. Concrete offers the marvelous uh, service and its ability to harden and thereby provide a firm foundation upon which to build. But a, a miserable service is rendered when figurative concrete settles and hardens the heart of man. We cannot build lives acceptable unto God with hearts that have become hardened uh, due to sin. And so the Hebrew writer said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But, he said, Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3, 12, and 13. The question I want to ask you today is, has your heart become hardened by sin? Or is your heart soft, pliable, receptive to the Savior and to the seed which is the Word of God? Luke 8 and verse 11. I hope and I pray that it is that your heart is not hardened like cement. If you'll become receptive to the Word of God and hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith that Christ is the Son of God, you can be baptized in water for the remission of sins even today. We'd love to assist you in that if we can. Thank you, friends, for watching, and remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.